Sully will make sure you get on the plane. Enriquez will stay with you. Make sure you get off. I don't hear from either one of them. She's dead. How much did pay in your penance? They offered me a hundred grand. Do you want to know something? When I found out I'd get my hands on you, I said I'd do it for nothing. Hey, hold it. I'll be back, Bennett. Mad Max Minute Podcast. I'm Rick. And I'm Julia. And today we are watching Commando from 1985. It was directed by Mark L. Lester, written by Jeff Loeb, Matthew Weissman, and Stephen E. D'Souza, and it stars Arnold Schwarzenegger, Ray Don Chong, and Vernon Wells. I'm really excited to see Vernon Wells in something else. Mm. Was he the... We just watched the trailer. Was he the bald guy with the dark mustache? He was the guy wearing, like, the chainmail shirt. Okay, I didn't notice a chainmail shirt. You're definitely going to notice him as we're watching. He plays a guy named Bennett. Okay. And he was the one that was talking about how Arnold Schwarzenegger is going to do exactly what they say because yes. they kidnapped that girl, who is, of course, Alyssa, Alyssa Milano. Milano. <laughs> as little Jenny Matrix, the daughter of Arnold Schwarzenegger's John Matrix. And... I'm not exactly sure why they kidnapped her daughter and why they're killing all of John Matrix's friends. I'm assuming it's because he's a commando in some way. I have never seen this movie before. Neither have I. So I'm very excited to watch it. As I mentioned in our last hiatus episode, this is a all-out action movie with big stars and big budget and all of the power of Hollywood behind it. It's not a cheap knockoff or anything like that it is a legitimate movie and i'm excited to watch it yeah i'm expecting to have a good time because i i don't think i've ever seen an arnold schwarzenegger movie that really disappointed me the first one i ever saw of his i want to say it was the terminator saw it over at a friend's house but even movies like batman and robin and jingle all the way like those movies the premises of them are just downright ridiculous but schwarzenegger just always gives a performance that is entertaining i think my first schwarzenegger movie was twins i still haven't seen that one yeah which i I gotta show you it's a pretty good movie now what's the premise of twins the premise of twins is that this group of scientists were doing an experiment i think it was kind of gene expression experiments Uh uh So they took uh, however many, I can't remember exactly how many, so we'll call it seven. Seven of the best athletes, the smartest people, the best scientists, the best musicians. Like they took a group of men with the best genes and they combined their genes together and impregnated a woman with whatever result they came up with. That little uh, cocktail. Yes. Which, I mean, is absolutely ridiculous. You just can't do that. But anyways... So Arnold Schwarzenegger is the result of that experiment. And then he was taken to be raised, like, away from society with the best teachers and all this kind of stuff. He was, like, in a perfect environment type thing. Yeah. So he grows up to be this incredibly strong, intelligent, philosophical person and decides he wants to go find his mother. And it turns out that it was twins that were born, not just one. But all the good stuff went to Arnold Schwarzenegger, and all, like, the leftover stuff, (laughs) all the bad genes, went to Danny DeVito's character. Okay. Yeah. So that's why they're twins. That explains why Arnold Schwarzenegger is this gigantic Adonis of a man and Danny DeVito is just Danny DeVito. Yes, exactly. (laughs) So they go find their mom and they they meet the scientist who did it and and all that kind of stuff. They fall in love. Not with each other. I mean, you know, they learn to love each other as brothers. But they each fall in love. Okay. With other people that are blood related. Okay. (laughs) Like, what kind of movie is this? No. Now, I don't know off the top of my head what kind of romantic subplots exist in this movie. I know that uh, 
Ray Don Chong comes in as a woman named Cindy. And from the trailer, I was able to see that she's kind of a helper for John Matrix. Yes. In some way. I know in the trailer, she fires a rocket launcher backwards and it's funny and whatnot. But right. I'm sure she'll play into the movie in a bigger way. But I'm looking forward to Arnold one-liners. They had a couple of really good ones in the trailer. I'm hoping there's more than just what they showed. I'd be oh. really disappointed if <laughs> they burned through all their good material in the trailer and left nothing about left oh no I, no one's ever done that <laughs> that would be preposterous but i can't really think of anything else on off the top of that yeah i think my expectations are really only to have a good time yeah to have a fun adventure i'm not expecting like shakespeare yeah <laughs> I'm expecting Arnold. Yeah. And if you expect Arnold, you're not going to be disappointed because he is consistent in his performances. Mm -hmm. He is always Arnold. We are going to play the trailer for everyone. And when the trailer is over, we will have watched the movie and we will be back with our initial reactions. <laughs> hunted him down. You know, Colonel, we went to a lot of trouble to find you. They murdered his friends. And they took the only thing he would kill for. If you want your kid back, then you gotta cooperate. Right? Wrong. Now, somewhere, somehow, someone's gonna pay. Do you think that he is going to give us any problems? You'll do exactly as he's told. Last of the way, good fellas. You're a funny guy, Sally. That's why I'm going to kill you last. Now are you going to tell me what's going on or what? No. Don't disturb my friend. He's dead tired. What are you doing? Helping you get her back. Remember, Sally, when I promised to kill you last? That's what made you think you did. I lied. Ah! If it's a mission no man can survive, he's the man for the job. Arnold Schwarzenegger, Commando. Let's party. And we're back. Yes, we are. Julia, you are usually not a fan of action movies, so I'm interested to hear your initial reaction as we've finished watching Commando. I enjoyed it. It was the good time that I thought it was going to be. Uh-huh. <laughs> what I don't usually like about action scenes is that they tend to go on for a long time, and... I think I've learned that just come back for the outcome and you're all set. But in this movie, Arnold Schwarzenegger, he makes them interesting. He makes them fun. Mm -hmm. Like in the middle of an action sequence, he'll pull out a one-liner or he'll do something kind of goofy or something particularly badass that helped to hold my attention I did feel the length of some of the action scenes. I think mostly the climax. I felt the length of the climax, but that's just the nature of a climax. It's, it's going to be the biggest and the best and the longest, because that's what it is. What was your initial reaction? I went into this movie expecting a shoot 'em up action type thing. I didn't realize that it was going to be Arnold following clues and gaining information and going from point to point trying to find out, you know, where they were keeping his daughter. There was so much more to this movie than I thought there was going to be, and that's really cool in my mind. I mean, the idea of Arnold Schwarzenegger going somewhere and having to find out information in order to lead him to a bad guy, it's kind of standard Arnold Schwarzenegger formula, so I should have expected it from the onset. In fact, I feel like this movie has a lot of similarities to his other film, Total Recall, which I brought up while we were watching, mm -hmm. and you were like, I haven't seen Total Recall, so that's one we have to watch another time. Yeah. But I really enjoyed, I'd say... 
the first two thirds of this movie just as much as that last third where he's storming the compound doing commando stuff. Yeah, I really liked that as a commando, he's not just a shoot 'em up kind of guy. Like, he's also very smart and he's also, you know, has tracking skills and all sorts of other skills that you see on display throughout the movie. Mm -hmm. Most of the movie is just him being smart and strategic until he gets to the end and then we get a great shoot 'em up. Right scene that everybody wants and expects and it's everything you want it to be yeah this is a great movie i think after the last movie we saw this was a great palate cleanser we have balanced out the low production quality of metal storm with just the over-the-top awesomeness of commando and I'm not going to say that there's a direct parallel, that the Papagallo movie was kind of bad and the Wes movie was kind of awesome. <laughs> but it does kind of mirror their characters from The Road Warrior that we really didn't like Papagallo and we really didn't like Metal Storm and we loved Wes and Commando was so great. Yeah. Should we go through the story? Yeah, let's go through the story. Right. Let me begin by saying the opening scene of Commando is total garbage yeah it really is like not that not that the scene itself is bad it just revolves around a garbage truck <sighs> don't give me that look it's an audio format people aren't gonna catch up that you're giving me a glare go on <laughs> <laughs> the first two scenes of this movie are these hitmen going through and killing former members of arnold schwarzenegger who's a guy named john matrix Former members of his tactical squad or something like that. These are guys that are all retired. They've got new identities. They've got new lives. The first guy that's killed is just some Joe Schmo type living in the suburbs. He hears the garbage truck pull up and he's like, oh no, they changed it to a Tuesday. I got to get the garbage out. So he comes down his driveway with his garbage and he's like, oh, I'm glad I caught you guys. I was afraid you would miss me. And of course, the garbage guys are really assassins. And they're like, oh, we won't miss you. And then they blow them away. <laughs> and as soon as you hear that line, that we won't miss you, you know exactly what kind of movie it's going to be. Because mm -hmm. <laughs> the entire movie is like 75% one-liners. Yeah. Oh, it's great. I think almost everybody in this movie has some good ones. Yeah. So the first guy's killed by a garbage man type deception. The second guy is a car salesman at a, I would assume it's a Cadillac dealership. It's like high-end cars. Yeah. Which I want to say, this salesman is trying to sell a Cadillac and then goes into the benefits of vinyl seating over leather. And I'm like, okay, if you're going to spend the money on a Cadillac, go for leather. Well, it was the 80s. That was abundantly clear. It was. It, it really, really was. <laughs> if there was one thing about this movie that is just to the nines, it's the fact that it takes place in the 80s. The fact that they filmed this in the middle of a decade that is so stylized in its own special way. <laughs> but this guy who's trying to sell a Cadillac with vinyl seats, which once again, ew. ew. The assassin who's in the Cadillac posing as a buyer is like, you know what the best thing I like about Cadillacs? And the salesman's like, what? And the guy in the car says, it's price. And he fires up the car, pulls back, and then runs the dude over. Drives through the glass wall, drives away. Which I think we both agreed probably wouldn't kill the salesman. It would probably wound him. Yeah, yeah. It, it didn't look like a deadly hit yeah. to me. And then, of course, the third operative that we see hit is Vernon Wells, who is a fisherman, I guess. He comes down a dock. Mm -hmm. Hops onto a boat, says hello to a couple other guys. And it's here that we heard something. We actually had to stop and rewind. Yeah. Okay, here's what we're up against. Either one of those fishermen, his character was named Wes, or one of those fishermen looked at Vernon Wells and called him Wes. Someone in that trio <laughs> called someone else in that trio Wes. And I swear I heard it. I'm pretty sure that I heard it. 
It's probably somebody said something else with an accent. Yeah. And it wasn't the focal point of the scene. It's not like we clearly heard the dialogue. It was a tiny detail. And it was only like a word and a half. He said something Wes. Like, hey Wes, or something like that. Yeah. So there wasn't enough words to pick up what kind of accent it was to help interpret what he said. But it sounded like Wes. <laughs> Vernon Wells goes from that first boat, hops onto his boat, and then starts driving away. When you're on a boat, it's you drive a boat, right? You don't always sail. I don't know what the verbiage is. I'm not... Right, for like a fishing boat, like a motorboat. I'm not the nautical type like you are. Uh, I think you drive it. Okay. Yeah. But as he's driving away, the assassin that was in the Cadillac pulls out some sort of remote detonator and explodes the boat. And for all we know... Bennett. His name is Bennett. Bennett is dead. Yeah. We can't call him Wes the whole time. Now, I'm looking at the trivia page for Commando on IMDb. And in one of the entries, it says, During Bennett's entrance at the docks, the fisherman on his boat greets him via ADR with, What do you say, Wes? So, Thank you. So we're not the only ones that heard it. Yeah. So there is a little callback yeah. to the Road Warrior, which... I think someone was just having fun. It's delightful. Yeah. And this was not long after Road Warrior, right? No, only four years. Okay. So for all we know, these three guys are dead. Mm -hmm. The next thing we see is a short montage of just parts of John Matrix. We start with his feet. We go to one of his biceps. We see his shoulders and his chest, and we just get this slow progression until it's finally revealed that we are looking at Arnold Schwarzenegger, and he is carrying a chainsaw in one hand and a tree in the other. Yes, yes, he's carrying like a whole tree, and that's our first clue as to what kind of Arnold Schwarzenegger movie this is going to be. This right. is going to be a classic, in all his glory, Schwarzenegger movie. <laughs> Did I ever show you the video from Cracked.com where they were talking about Arnold Schwarzenegger and how every Arnold Schwarzenegger movie that we see could be interpreted as a simulation that is running through the programming of the T-800. Yes, I did see that video, and it was very interesting. Yeah, the idea that the humans that have captured the T-800 are trying to humanize him and get him to care about humans and human children specifically Yes, through all of these different interactions. It's empathy training, yes. so that way when they send him back for T-2, he can protect John Connor as a child. <laughs> I totally buy it. Yeah. Arnold does a lot of things in this movie that just make him look like he's got superhuman strength. So then we're introduced to his daughter, mm -hmm. Jenny, played by Alyssa Milano, a very, very young Alyssa Milano. What year did... I'm going to look it up real quick. What year was this movie done? This movie was 1985. And we're introduced to Alyssa Milano in a scene where John Matrix, who in the credit is just credited as Matrix... So we'll call him John, we'll call him John Matrix, we'll call him Matrix, whatever. But it's Arnold Schwarzenegger. He's yeah. chopping wood, and he lifts up his axe, and he sees the faint reflection of someone walking up behind him, and it's Alyssa Milano. So Alyssa Milano, who's the boss, which is where I know her from. Mm -hmm. I was never into Charmed, so I know her from Who's the Boss, started in 1984. Mm -hmm. So she was even younger in Who's the Boss than she is here, which... Is crazy to me <laughs> that she was like ever this young. <laughs> She's like 13 in this movie. Okay. Now, I don't really have firsthand experience with 1985. Uh, and I know that don't you don't really have firsthand experience. Right, in that I didn't exist yet. And you have extremely limited experience with 1985. But uh -huh. the wardrobe that she wears. In this movie, looking back in your experience, would you say that this is how 13-year-olds dressed normally in 1985? Uh, okay, so... Because you watched Who's the Boss and all that other stuff. Right. This is a similar way that her character in Who's the Boss might have dressed. Mm -hmm. This was a little over the top. The outfit that she stays in the whole time. And we get a little opening montage of daddy-daughter time. Where she's in a couple different outfits. But the outfit that she stays in, the pink chucks, the overalls, she's got like charms and stuff hanging from her overalls. I don't remember anything like that. But like the oversized overalls that are rolled up on the bottom with high top sneakers, that seems very 80s from my memory. Yeah, I liked the inclusion of the pink chucks because I felt like it was just another 
little detail connection to Road Warrior. Probably yeah. not done intentionally. Oh, no, not at all. They probably did pink chucks because she was a 13-year-old girl. Right. But even so, we notice the little things sometimes. Yes. So they have this fun little montage of them going out for ice cream and swimming. And there is one point where they are hand feeding a deer. That one was over the top. (laughs) I appreciate the daddy daughter montage. It showed us that first of all, it's just the two of them. Mm. There are no other kids. There is no wife that they have a good, strong relationship that he is teaching her to be a capable person. Yeah. He's teaching her to fish and do karate, do karate. So, which is a nice little clue because she stands up for herself as much as she can in this movie. I'm not going to say she's like a badass little kid or anything, but she doesn't spend the entire movie just sitting there crying, you know? So that's a good kind of lead up to that's the kind of person he's raising. And it also shows us his tender fatherly side. Yeah. Like when she sticks ice cream in his face. She pulls a Jesse. Yes. (laughs) And... (laughs) And, you know, it's it's a goofy moment where they're both laughing and having fun. Mm-hmm. We get to see that, yeah, he's the Paul Bunyan hanging out in the woods, but he's still a dad. It kind of makes me wonder what happened to Mrs. Matrix. Right. They never bring her up. Ever. And honestly, maybe there is no story there. Maybe in his commandoing ways, there was a port in the storm and he ended up with a kid. Either that or it could be that him and... Mrs. Matrix are divorced because she was unsatisfied with him going away on all of these missions. Well, if you're a wife and a mother and you're unsatisfied with your husband because he's never home and he lives a dangerous lifestyle, why would you leave your kid with that person? Maybe he has partial custody. Maybe this was his father's weekend. Yeah, that could be a thing. Maybe that's why the montage was kind of intense. Like, they were spending a couple of days, there was a couple different outfits, so a couple of days just really intensely being daddy-daughter. Yeah. Like, she's 13. Do you really think she wants to spend that much time with her dad? Like, no. She wants to go in her bedroom and listen to music and talk on the phone with her friends. But she wasn't. She was so specifically hanging out with her dad. Yeah. I'll bet it was his weekend. And she was really upset at the idea of him going away on another mission. So, I'm willing to bet... That the reason he and Mrs. Matrix are separated is because he spent so much time away working with the U.S. Army. Yeah. Destabilizing Central American Uh countries (laughs) that Mrs. Matrix was like, I can't live like this thinking every day I'm going to turn on the news and hear about my commando husband who was publicly executed in the village square of a South American country. Yeah. That makes a lot of sense. Plus, I mean, her being his, like, entire world makes a lot of sense if he only has, like, a limited time with her. Every other week or if she just gets sent out for a couple of months during the summertime. Like, maybe her mother lives in a city with a good school district. And so the nine months of school time, she lives with her mother. And then the three months of summertime, she lives with her dad. Yeah, that makes sense, too. So they get a lot of together time and she gets to learn a lot of stuff from him and she still gets to go to a good school elsewhere right because if she lives up there in the mountains i mean it's incredibly isolated it is and i'm sure that rural schools aren't lesser because they're rural you know Mm -hmm. city schools aren't better because they're city schools But she's just so far away from anything. Yeah. And I'd like to think that the separation between John and unnamed Mrs. Matrix was probably a little rough at first, but I feel like he's the kind of guy that would understand where she's coming from. He does seem very sympathetic to his daughter's desire for him not to leave again. Yeah. And that is brought up specifically twice in the movie, in the beginning at the end, Mm -hmm. where she's like, you're not going to go, are you? Don't go. And he says... No, I'm not going anywhere. Yeah. I'm not going anywhere. We kind of got off the track yeah. of this daddy daughter montage. Yes, but we did. We end it with them sitting at the table and <laughs> Alyssa Milano's character, Jenny, she made a couple of sandwiches because they're having lunch and John is sitting at the table and he's reading cream. I think it was like a teen girl magazine. Yeah. <laughs> Which and he was adorable. And he made a joke about how instead of being called boy george that he should just be called girl george to make it easier for everyone yes (laughs) and how when (laughs) rock and roll came to east germany when he was a child the communists called it subversive and he's like maybe they were right (laughs) (laughs) and didn't jenny 
say something like, you're missing the point? Yeah. Like, I think she called him old fashioned or yeah. something like that. She called him an old man. <laughs> oh, it was great. I love that he was reading in Teen Girl magazine. Oh my gosh. So he puts down the magazine and he looks out the window because they've got these beautiful, gorgeous oh, picture windows overlooking a house. valley. Their house is stunning. Oh. I mean, granted, it's in California, and California catches on fire every year now, so... Yeah, but it doesn't snow. That's a good point. Well, not in Southern California. But he's looking out over the valley, and he sees a helicopter approaching. And given the montage of people being killed that we saw, I was a little concerned that they were going to fly up and start shooting rockets out of the helicopter. Kind of like, um, I think it's Iron Man 3 that that happens. But as the helicopter flies around, we get to see the side of it, and it's the U.S. Army. And so it lands, and out pops Major General Franklin Kirby, played by James Olsen. Yep. And he is there specifically to warn John about the killings of the other members. But he hops out of the helicopter, walks up towards the house, and he's like, John, come out. And John sneaks up behind him and steals his gun. Yeah, that was like, pretty good. I'm still quiet. I'm still deadly. Yeah. It's great. And in order to offer John additional protection, General Kirby leaves behind a couple of soldier dudes. I didn't catch their names, but... It doesn't matter what their names are. They're about to leave. Because as soon as the general takes off in his helicopter, he's not even, like, out of earshot, I swear. Bad guys from the main villain of this film pop out of the bushes and start shooting up the place. And of course, John is able to get back inside the house with Jenny and he sends her to her room and he goes out to his gun shed. It makes me wonder why the guns are out in the shed away from the main house instead of like throughout the house, like Like, little mini gun safes, like in every room. And you specifically asked why she doesn't have a safe room, right? Like, is he that confident that he's never going to get attacked after what he did in, yeah. for the army? They should have, what was that movie? Panic Room. It was Panic Room. The one with Kristen Stewart and Jodie Foster. Yes. They should have one of those in that house. Because <laughs> it looks like he has the money to mm-hmm. afford to put something like that in. And when he's talking to the general, it's made clear that John has a new identity. So they realize that his life is forever going to be in danger. Mm -hmm. So a panic room just makes sense. It does. Especially when you have a kid. If it was just him up there, probably not. Mm -hmm. He would never use a panic room for himself. Yeah. But he has a kid. Yeah. Unfortunately for him, it takes him so long to get out to his gun shed and retrieve his rifle that the bad guys infiltrate the house, kill the soldiers completely, get into Jenny's room and kidnap her. And when he gets back into the house, one of the kidnapper guys is just sitting there being all smug, talking about, oh, we took your daughter and you need to cooperate with us or we're going to kill her. And he's like, I don't need to cooperate with you. And then he shoots the guy between the eyes. Yes. They had to know. You know what? They didn't leave a vehicle behind. Mm -mm. So they knew that that guy wasn't going to survive. And when John runs outside and sees these black cars driving away, his first thought is, oh, I need to chase them in my car. Of course, they went into his engine and disabled his vehicle. And so his solution is to push his truck over the edge of a ridge because it's all downhill. Yeah. From his place. And so he hops in his car and he's speeding downhill in a non-powered vehicle. And he, the road is switching back and forth and he's got all of these close misses trying to take these guys out. Yeah. And he also has no brakes. Mm-hmm. So he's just taking the chance. And the kidnappers are going down switchbacks. So he actually like crosses paths with them. At least twice. At least twice before the final crash. Which, unfortunately for John, is not him crashing into them. It's him going into a ditch and the truck turning over and whatnot. He crawls out of the truck and then the truck explodes. So the kidnappers are going to investigate the truck. And I thought what was going to happen is that he was going to get away and they were going to think that he died in the crash. But they find him, they surround him, and it takes, what, five or six people to pin him to the ground? Yes. And it's at this point that we see that Bennett is still alive. Yes, and on the bad guy side. You remember in the opener when I said that he had a chainmail shirt? Yes. I lied. (laughs) It's a woven mesh shirt. <laughs> it's not a chain mail? Nope. Because he was clinging the whole time. His shirt itself is just, yeah, woven like fabric cord. Okay. Because, yeah, when he walked, he made a lot of noise. 
I think he just had clinky things on his belt. Okay. But he shows up and he's like, hello, John. And he shoots him right in the chest. And I'm going to try very hard not to do a Vernon Wells Australian impression. I'm going to try very hard to stick to my own because I know everyone hates it when I do impression work. (laughs) I'm still trying. Every day I try not to do impressions. I'm still working on it. Or you go the opposite direction and work on it to make them better. (laughs) I don't know which one of those is better. (laughs) Bennett shoots John with a tranquilizer, which we can only assume is meant for, like, horses or elephants or something like that. Right. And when John comes to, he is chained to a table, and he is face-to-face with the South American former dictator, whose name is Arius Arius. He is played by Dan Hedaya. Which is one of those character actors that you see everywhere, and I didn't know his name. He's got a swell cleft in his chin, I'll say that much. Mm Mm-hmm. But he is, like I said, the former dictator of a country... That John Matrix and his commando team went in and destabilized and put in place a puppet government that the U.S. could have influence over. And this guy is just really peeved about that. And so he basically tells John, listen, you're going to fly to Valverde, my country. You are going to assassinate the president that your government put in place. And then I will release your daughter and you can just go because I will be president and I will have what I want. John is not pleased with this idea. He doesn't like the idea that they've kidnapped his daughter and that they're blackmailing him. Not blackmail. What's the extorting? Is that the word? Yeah. He really doesn't appreciate that. And of course, Vernon Wells the whole time is like eating this up. He loves the idea of getting back at John because John expelled him from his commando unit for excessive violence. Yes, he did. So they basically set up John with a chaperone escort and another one of the lackeys. You've got David Patrick Kelly who plays Sully, and Charles Meshack, who plays Enriquez. And these guys bring John to the airport. Yeah. Bennett drops them off, and he's like, listen, if I don't hear from one of these guys that you've gotten to Valverde, we're going to kill your daughter. And so John's like, you're a real piece of work, or something like that. In fact, it's in this scene that Arnold leans in close to Vernon Wells and says, I'll be back. Yes, it is. Yep. It's his Terminator callback. Yep. So I like this little sequence because Sully is taunting John. And John's like, I like you, Sully. You're funny. That's why I'm going to kill you last. (laughs) Which is so unsettling. (laughs) Reminds me of, and I can't remember what it's from. There's a scene in a movie where the good guy who is like super duper fighter type, is faced with a group of like six to eight bad guys and he tells them what order he's going to kill them in. That is Arnold Schwarzenegger in True Lies because they gave him a truth serum and he's like... That's right! Oh my gosh! He's like, I'm going to escape and I'm going to kill every one of you. And they're like, oh yeah? How? And then he He details. tells them how. (laughs) True Lies is a really good movie. Yep, another Arnold Schwarzenegger movie Yep, where he's got a daughter that he's got to save. At least in that one, he's still married. Who's his daughter in that one? I want to say it's Kristen Stewart, but I don't think it is. I think it's a Kristen Stewart type. True Lies, made in 1994, features Arnold Schwarzenegger, married to Jamie Lee Curtis, and their daughter is played by Eliza Dushku. Okay, yeah. She played She's Dana. definitely a... She's so much better than Kristen Stewart, though. Yes, but physically, they're kind of the same type. Yeah, more or less. Anyway, they get on the plane. They have first-class seats, which... I gotta say, it's an 11-hour flight. Thank goodness they sprung for first class, because if they stuck John Matrix in economy, they think he's mad now. Yeah, and his escort is just as big as he is. Mm -hmm. They're lucky they fit into the first class seats. So John sits down. He asks the stewardess for a blanket and a pillow, and she gives him one, and he's sitting there scoping out different exits on the plane. He's noticing what everyone's doing, and... As soon as he gets a moment of somewhat privacy, he wraps his arm around Enrique's neck, snaps his neck, and then puts the pillow behind his head, puts the blanket over him. Enriquez is wearing a hat, and he sets the hat over and leans him up against the wall, and he looks at the stewardess and says, Don't bother my friend. He's dead tired. Oh. Because he's dead, and he looks like he's sleeping. <laughs> so great. It kind of is. It makes me groan at the same time I recognize how great it is. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So he gets up and he is walking through the plane and the stewardess is like, "Uh, sir, you need to be sitting while we're taking off. And he's like, I'm airsick. And it's like, okay, 
I guess. I don't know. It no, a it's not time. okay. It's not okay. They're not in the air. It's a different time. They were smoking in the airport. Yeah, one of the instructions was to put out your cigarettes. So, yeah. He goes through a hatch and through several different compartments and he finds himself hanging from the landing gear of the airplane as it's taking off. Yeah, and we are yelling at him to hurry up and drop because the plane is only speeding up. Right. And I'm like, looking at this... And it's like, okay, and, is he going to drop and roll on yeah. the tarmac? That and seems a little ridiculous. And the front wheel lifts off the ground, and he's getting higher and higher. And they're about to clear the end of the runway, and we're like, what the heck is his plan? And then we see it. There's a marshes, lake, swamp type area at the end of the runway, mm-hmm. and that's where he drops down. Because so, he's smart. So he drops off the bottom of the plane, falls who knows how far, and lands in the swampy area drags himself out of the swamp, gets back into the terminal, and he tracks down Sully. This was actually the most disturbing part of this entire movie. Because we follow Sully for a little while. While John is getting from the tarmac back into the terminal, we hang out with Sully for a little while. He he made a phone call to... Let Arius know that they were on the plane. That they were successfully on the plane. And while he's on the phone, he's checking out the woman at the phone next to him. Mm -hmm. And very lovely young woman, very slim figure. She's a very slim figure. Yep, this is Ray Don Chong, who plays Cindy. And while Cindy is still on the phone, Sully goes up and stands like right next to her leering leering at her and then starts talking to her she's still on the phone i mean that's the first rudeness is that she is still on the phone while he is trying to sexually harass her so she gets off the phone and he is just all sorts of in her personal space and hitting on her not even like hitting on her well more just just real sleaze bag stuff. Yeah, like, sounds like you need a date for tonight and blah blah blah. It's just so gross. And he follows her all he the way does. to the parking garage, which is very. I feel really bad for her. That's a very scary thing. I mean, at first they were in the terminal where there were lots of people around. She didn't realize that he was following her, but they get to the parking garage. And that's when you just know something bad is going to happen. So she gets to her car and he continues to hit on her and she rebuffs him one final time. He calls her, okay, he calls her a whore. I, well, there's lots of problems with this. Yeah. My biggest problem is that wouldn't she be a whore if she just jumped right in bed with you? Isn't that when she would be a whore? Yeah. This is the fact that she won't jump in bed with you. She's being the opposite of a whore. This is like... Like, it, that insult doesn't make any sense. Okay, this is the exact type of thing that you still see today. Oh, absolutely. Guys that connect with women on Tinder, and then the women rebuff the men in just the slightest way, even if it's polite. And these guys will go from zero to a hundred with the insults and the negging, and it's like, what? Mm, I want to, like, reach through the computer screen and, like stab these guys in the eye because they're just being complete and total monsters. I'm trying to keep my (laughs) verbiage in check. Yeah, we could say some really awful things about him, but we don't want to go overboard with the language. I still need to edit this, and I don't want to make more work for myself. (laughs) Yes. So he is the epitome of what's wrong in our world. Yeah, he's just an awful, awful human being. But he walks away, thankfully. That is not the end of Cindy's trouble, though, because... John sneaks up behind her, puts his gigantic mitt of a hand over her mouth, and is like, be quiet, get in your car, I need your help. And he proceeds to tear the passenger seat out of her car with his bare hands. I was so disappointed in how John and Cindy connected. I thought that John was going to rescue Cindy from Sully. I thought Sully was going to attack her and try and rape her or something. And that John was going to come in and save her. And that was going to be how they met and how they connected enough that she was going to continue on to help him. But no, John just kidnapped Cindy, which I just, yeah. Throughout this movie, it becomes clear that John is okay with being the bad guy Mm -hmm. to serve his own good guy purposes. The ends justify the means. That's like his philosophy. But I'm just disappointed That he kidnapped another person Mm -hmm. to save his kidnapped daughter. Two wrongs do not make a right. I mean, it ends up working in the end, but he basically, yeah, kidnaps her. They hop in the car and he's like, follow that Porsche. And she's like, what? 
okay, fine, because you're a giant man and you tore the seat out of my car. What else am I going to do? Because you might try and kill me. I don't know. So they trail Sully to a shopping mall. And once they're inside the shopping mall, John is like, you need to follow him. You need to make it seem like you're interested in him and draw him to me. And he hasn't told her what's going on yet. He doesn't do that until after they've dealt with Sully. Right. So she, not knowing anything about him, follows Sully into a restaurant. Sully is making some sort of money deal with a guy. Yeah. For passports or something. And Cindy pulls aside mall security and is like, listen, there's this crazy guy who kidnapped me. I need you to take care of him. And so mall security sees John Matrix and they're like, we need all units. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. This is not a one man job. So John is sitting there trying to be inconspicuous, which good luck, buddy. Yeah. So the security guard says, hey, I got a guy about 6'2", but built like an elephant. So I need more hands. I can't take this guy by myself. 6'2 sounded short to me. So I looked it up. He is 6'2", mm-hmm. which still sounds short. Yeah, he's about an inch and a half taller than I am. Yeah, that seems weird. <laughs> but you put him in military boots and whatnot, that's going to make him closer to like 6'3", six, 6'4". Six, yeah. <laughs> yeah. And I mean, yeah, he's six feet tall. He's also about four feet wide made out of muscle. Yes. So we get some gratuitous shots of Arnold Schwarzenegger oh, in this movie. Yes, we do. Give you the vapors. Anyway, John is trying to remain inconspicuous. Mall security starts harassing him, and Sully sees John Matrix and freaks out because he's supposed to be on a plane. And this whole time this is happening, we missed a detail when he dropped into the swamp. He put a timer on his watch for 11 hours because that's how long it's going to take the plane to get to Valverde. So he has 11 hours to find Jenny, get her away from the kidnappers. So Sully sees John. Sully makes a run for it to try and call the people that he works for. John, while fighting off mall security, tears a phone booth with Sully inside off of the wall. And meanwhile, (laughs) there's a literal gunfight happening everywhere. This is complete insanity. Yeah, it really is. I... This mall security force was, like, legit a security force. Yeah, they had guns. They had guns for crying out loud. This was not your stereotypical Paul Blart mall cop situation. (laughs) This was anything but. There is one point where John is trying to get away from mall security, and he grabs a, I think it was a giant inflatable tube. Yeah. From the ceiling of the Yeah, just decoration. Mall. And he swings from an upper balcony over on top of the elevator that Sully is riding in, like Tarzan. Yeah. And Cindy actually calls him out and says he was swinging like Tarzan. Now, I kind of missed what happened. Cindy, like, in this scene, she changes allegiances. Mm -hmm. Like, initially, she's against John. Yeah, I mean, she turns him in. But then once she realizes that he's actually being shot at and trying to apprehend someone, I think she realizes that this is super serious, yo. Okay. She prevents him from getting shot. Mm Mm-hmm. She pushes the guard down the stairs that's going to shoot him. And then does she voluntarily get in the car with him? Yep. So John chases Sully into the parking garage of the mall and then they speed out. And as Sully speeds by the mall, John is coming up in front of the main entrance and Cindy runs out the front and says, stop, stop, let me in, let me in, and hops in the car with John. And then they start chasing Sully. Yeah. So she willingly goes with John. Yeah, I guess I don't really understand why I, to stay with her car. Maybe because she hops I mean, in and they're speeding along and she's like, are you going to tell me what's going on? And he's like, no. Oh, she's fantastic in that scene. She kind of does a little flip out thing, listing off all of the incredible things that she has witnessed in the last hour or so. Mm-hmm. And she's like on the verge of hysterics about the whole thing. Ending this with, are you going to tell me what's going on? And then Arnold's just like, no. <laughs> So And she's like, no, no. And she like flips out again. It's really great. Yeah. <laughs> John and Cindy chase Sully up into the hills. He's able to drive Sully's car off the road and Sully flips over and John pulls him out. Something I like about this scene is that Sully's flip over was not your typical Hollywood car flip over. It was so lame, which there's a reason for it because Cindy's car gets destroyed. Yeah. And they're without a vehicle, so they take Sully's. So he kind of rams up against the side of the hill, which is all dirt. Yeah. And kind of, like, 
falls lamely over. The onto car his rolls top. over onto its side. Yeah, but lamely. Yeah. Not cool. Just kind of pathetically. Yeah. John is able to find a hotel key in Sully's jacket, and then he dangles Sully over the edge of the cliff. And With his a weak arm. Below. And he's like, talk fast, Sully. This is my weak arm. And Sully's like, I'm not going to tell you where they are. I'm not going to tell you. And it's at that point that we get the line from the trailer that everyone heard when I played it. <laughs> Sully, do you remember when I told you that I would kill you last? I lied. And then he drops him. Yes, he does. And when he gets back to Cindy, she's like, where's Sully? And Arnold's like, I let him go. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> Which is not a lie. No. He let him go. No, not at all. That's when Arnold flips over Sully's car. Yeah, just kind of pushes it back onto its wheels. And uh -huh. they... And they drive away. The next lead that they have is a hotel key that John pulled from Sully's jacket. And when they get there, this hotel is kind wow. of like... If you took the 1980s and condensed it down into one building, there is neon everywhere. There are bright, garish colors. There are lights. There are interesting, to say the least, architectural choices going on. And Yeah, those glass cubes. Are everywhere. And that aren't even, like, held together by anything. Yeah. They're just stacked. Mm-hmm. I'm pretty sure they had some sort of, like, spackling to keep them in place, but they don't stay in place very well. No, if they did, it was minimal. Yeah. So they go into this hotel, and it's Sully's hotel room. It's got his stuff, and so they start looking for clues in the hotel room. And they're not really able to find anything, but then all of a sudden, one of the assassins, a guy named Cook played by Bill Duke. He was the one who shot the first guy, ran over the second guy, blew up, supposedly, Bennett, which didn't take, but it was all a staged thing anyway. So Cook shows up looking for Sully. And John's plan for taking out Cook, he turns on the shower, tears open Cindy's shirt, and says, make it look like you had a good time, and hides behind the door. Which she did a phenomenal job mm -hmm. playing the part. Although, if that assassin was, like, paying attention, she doesn't look like... She just put her clothes back on. She looks like she has been dressed for quite some time. <laughs> she just doesn't look like she had a good time. Yeah. She opens the door and Cook says, where's Sully? And she's like, in the shower. And he's like, who are you? And she says, room service. <laughs> Yeah, he, she did it well. And so Cook's like, I need to get in here right now. So he pushes his way in. And instead of ambushing Cook in any way, John like taps on his shoulder, basically wants to talk. And Cook is, of course, not in the mood for talking. He is in the mood for fighting. And it's here that we learn that Cook was a Green Beret. And we also learn that John Matrix eats Green Berets for breakfast. Yeah. <laughs> Makes me wonder what John Matrix was. He was commando. But a commando isn't a category. A commando is a label. Like, yeah. what was he? I guess he was the kind of guy that when I would assume the CIA needs to go into a foreign nation and destabilize a government, they call up the army and say, get your task force together. Give us John Matrix. And then he and his task force of other commandos go into foreign nations and destabilize foreign governments. That's not an answer. I know. Okay. Because the real answer is probably classified. Probably. <laughs> so, I mean, if you're not a Navy SEAL or a Green Beret or a Ranger or any of those, like, high-level groups that we know about, mm -hmm. like, what was he? The Army has Rangers. Yep. The Navy has... SEALs. Uh, the Marines are their own category. Yep. And the United States Army Special Forces are the Green Berets. So, apparently, you've got the Green Berets and then you've got the Rangers. The Rangers. Which I guess are two different things. Yeah. What I expect is that he is black ops with no name. Yeah. So they have a knockout, drag out fight in this hotel room. Meanwhile, Cindy's just cowering in the corner trying not to get shot. Right. And for someone who's trying not to get shot, she's awfully available for getting shot. Yeah. She's peeking her head out, trying to keep an eye on what's going on. We see them crash through that wall of glass blocks. Yep, we do. Like paper. And then we also see them crash through the wall to the hotel room next to them. Yep. I can understand why you want doors connecting hotel rooms like that for fire groups exits and fire exits and things like that. But the couple that are in this other hotel room, mm -hmm. this is our 
requisite nudity for the rated R film. The couple in there are under the covers doing things, and these two giant dudes with a gun barrel through their door, and it's at that point that they stop having relations. Right. Which I'm confused about because gunshots were going on in the hotel room next to them and they were still doing their own thing. They hadn't stopped yet. I mean, granted, it is a big city in California like L.A., so you probably hear gunshots outside anyway. But... Right, but in the hotel room right next to you, in the wall, they shot into the wall in between the two rooms. You would think that would tip them off to something weird going on. Yeah. But, nope. Nope. We actually don't spend all that much time with them because Arnold is able to get the fighting back into the main hotel room. He gives Cook one big shove and Cook goes backwards onto what I assume is a table leg. Yeah, that's what it looked like. And it kills him right out. They aren't able to find anything on Cook, but when they go through his car, Cindy finds an invoice for airplane fuel. So it turns out she is training to be a pilot. Mm -hmm. Now, is she... I think she's a stewardess. Okay. She was wearing little airplane wings on she her was. business type outfit. She mentioned on the phone that her flight had been canceled. Mm -hmm. uh, so she's trained to be a pilot. So she recognized not the company, but the area that the company was in. Like, oh, that's an area where they sell fuel. Yeah. So they go to this place. It's like a warehouse. And John sneaks in. They find essentially the... Valverde military forces that are loyal to Arius, and they've got like tanks and weapons and things, but he finds a map room and pulls Cindy up into the room and they're investigating and finding information. And it's at that point that they pinpoint where Arius's main base is. Which is an island, they say it's a two and a half hour flight? Something like that. With a pretty small plane. Yeah. So low and slow, but two and a half hour flight off the coast. Uh, I think it's off the coast of San Pedro or something like that. Yeah, somewhere like that. So their next step would be to go to that island. But before they decide to leave, John's like, I need to do some shopping first. Oh, that's right. <laughs> so they go to this Army-Navy surplus store, like a sporting goods store or something. And John gets a tractor, a bulldozer, really, drives through the front of the store. And then they just go up and down the aisles. And he's grabbing things off the shelf. And he's putting it in a shopping carriage that Cindy is pushing. Yes. And then he finds a secret button that opens up a back store room full of military weaponry, including oh, a rocket launcher. And grenades and automatic rifles. Like, this stuff's insane. There's no way it's legal. Right. I mean, even in the 80s, there's no way this stuff is legal. Yeah. So herself. Cindy gets everything out of the store, loads up the car, but before John can leave, the police show up because of course they would. Right. Of course there was an alarm on this building. He drove a bulldozer through the front of a building. Of course they would show up. The, I think the question is why they didn't show up sooner. Yeah. We weren't shown all of their time in the store. We were shown little snippets. So they were probably in the store for at least 10 or 15 minutes. Mm-hmm. Those cops should have been there within five. For a store like that that has that much weaponry inside, you know, if the alarm goes off there, it should be a very high priority. Yeah. By this point in the movie, we've already seen a cutaway with Arius and Bennett where they lock Jenny into a room. And you were very critical of this room. <laughs> Because it was very large. It there was. there were multiple exits. And there was at least two other doors that we could see. And we only saw half the room. Plus two doors to the outside, like an outside deck or patio. And at that point, the first time we saw the room, we couldn't tell that they had been boarded over. But later on, we learned they had been boarded over. Mm -hmm. So the room had been thought of as a holding space. And Jenny is a inventive little child because she pulls the doorknob out of the door and uses the doorknob bar to start prying one of the boards mm -hmm. off of that outside access way. And it takes her quite some time. We check in with her a couple of times. She's still working on it because mm -hmm. it has to line up the timing that she gets out at the same time that John lands on the island and starts his assault. Yeah, but she's not sitting there helpless. She's trying to escape. She's being proactive about it. Yeah, I do wish she didn't try the two. They look like they were probably closets. She didn't try the two closet doors. There could have been things inside there that were interesting and could help her in some way. Like crowbars? Perhaps. Imagine like she goes to open up the closet and, and it's just a bunch of crowbars. crowbars. <laughs> I mean, they were probably empty or locked, but check. Yeah. I was highly critical of the idea of them putting her in a giant room instead of like a small closet. Like, 
Harry Potter that girl. Right. <laughs> <laughs> we cut back to John and Cindy. John is in the back of a paddy wagon being driven away by a couple of cops. And Cindy catches up. And they have a quick little interaction where one of the cops assumes that Cindy is a hooker, which is... What? Why? So out of nowhere. And that's why I have no sympathy for them when she pulls out the rocket launcher that he took from the store. Yeah. And... Oh, she does it in such a badass way, too. She stands up in her convertible. Well, it's Cook's convertible. But she stands up in it and she hefts this rocket launcher onto her shoulder. And she fires it once, which she accidentally fires it backwards because, I mean, the rocket launcher is a giant box with some tubes that pull out. Which, yeah. who knows? She misfires once, turns it around, and then launches a rocket at the paddy wagon, hitting the back tire, causing the whole thing to turn over, saving John from having to go to jail. Unfortunately, this means that she has used two out of the four shells for the rocket launcher. Yeah. But at least they're away. And as they are driving away, John's like, how did you know how to do that? And she's like, I read the instructions. Yeah, that was pretty great. (laughs) (laughs) From there, they get to the pier where the plane is being held. The one that was refueled with the invoice. And they load up the plane. And she hops in it and she's like, this is not what I'm used to flying. This is not what I've been trained for. This plane is old. Yeah. She's like, there's no LED displays. I kind of feel like that was said because LEDs were like the next big thing. The new hotness in 1985. Right. And I mean, somebody, me today sitting down in an old plane would have said the exact same thing. There's no LED displays. I don't know what all these things do. But I feel like it was pointed, like, that she is training in, like, super modern situation. Yeah. They're able to get away from the pier in this plane. And there's this funny thing where she, like, can't get it to start. And so John gets into the cockpit and just mashes on the dashboard a couple of times. Like, the fawns and the things just starts right up. And does he say something like, that always works? Yeah. Uh, As a commando, whatever that's supposed to mean, shouldn't he know how to fly? I, commandos can't be well versed in everything. Yes, they can. That's their job. Well, you don't know what their jobs are. I you mean, were just well. That's true. But I've seen lots of movies. <laughs> I've seen lots and lots of movies where commando types just get into the cockpit of a plane and take off. I do feel like being able to fly a plane in a helicopter is kind of commando one hundred and one. Right up there with firing a rocket launcher the the right direction. (laughs) I don't know. Yeah. The important thing is that they get up into the air and they start flying towards this island. There is a small little incident as they're flying along where they are picked up by a couple of Coast Guard dudes. One of them, of course, being Bill Paxton. Yeah. Out of the blue. Yeah, I like that. And they're like, hey, you're flying over a live fire training zone. You can't do this. And Cindy's like, yeah, we the airlines really avoid this area. And John's like, can you fly below radar? And she's like, well, not Navy radar. <laughs> and he's like, well, fly lower. <laughs> I just, I don't think John understands where they are. Yeah. Okay, Bill Paxton, like, he's not threatening to shoot them down. He's basically saying, if you don't get out of this training area, we can't guarantee your safety. Right, and it's also, it's also illegal. It's not that the airlines avoid this area like the plague. Like Cindy says, it is a no-fly zone. Mm -hmm. It's not like airplanes avoid flying over the White House. They are not allowed to fly over the White House. They are not allowed to fly through this live training zone. So we're watching Bill Paxton look at the radar screen and we see the plane, we see the plane, and then we don't see the plane because they've flown down low to be masked by the waves, which I guess works. Oh, well, in this movie it does. The important thing is, is that they arrive at Arius's island and it's at this point that John and Cindy have to part ways. John loads up a raft with all of his gear and he, the next time we see him, is in this raft in just his briefs. Yes. He is more or less out there for the world to see. And Cindy's in the plane and he's giving her instructions like, Once the proverbial poop hits the fan, I need you to radio such and such a frequency with coordinates and calling for the general and all this other stuff. Right. And then he starts like rowing away. And it's at this point that I looked at you and I'm like, she's left all alone in that plane with that image. (laughs) His rippling muscles are certainly on display. We get this awesome shot of him rowing and you get to like see his muscles working. Yeah. As he's going with this. And I'm like, that's gratuitous. (laughs) It is. I definitely appreciate it because a lot of his movies use his muscles 
as part of the movie. But, you know, we just don't get to see them like this. Like, he's really showing off what his body can do in that scene. We really get to see all of his muscles working. Mm -hmm. And there's no shortage of seeing his muscles. But seeing them actually work is better. Yeah. He gets to shore, and he suits up. All of the things that he grabbed from the surplus store, he must have been very meticulous about making sure he got the right size because he gets the boots and the pants and the vest and he gears up and he paints himself for battle. And the next portion of the movie is essentially him assaulting this compound as a one-man army. He sets up a bunch of explosives. He blows up at least three buildings all at once and then just goes out in a shooting spree, killing every single enemy soldier that he comes across. This was great because you pointed out to me, we just watched UHF to be on uh, somebody else's podcast. Hopefully. I haven't been invited yet. But. Oh, oh, okay. We were, we were pre-gaming. Right. And there is a fantasy scene with Weird Al where he does the same thing. And Rick pointed that out to me. So now I get the reference in the parody movie that he was parodying this scene. Yeah. And he's going through this very idyllic looking villa. And he's yeah, shooting. beautiful. The garden is beautiful. He's shooting through rose bushes and whatnot. And it's... One of those situations, like when you're playing a military shooter, where you can try and go in stealthy and take people out one at a time, or you can just trip the alarm and just mow down dudes <laughs> with a light machine gun like he does in this movie. Yeah. One way is smart and one way is fun. Yep. There is one point where he is cornered in a tool shed and these soldiers come up and they start firing through the walls of the tool shed. And when they are satisfied firing through the walls, one guy opens the door and John Matrix comes out the door with a pitchfork, kills the first guy, grabs some circular saw blades... Cuts one guy's head, not off, but like the top of his head off. He throws a circular saw blade into another guy's chest and he chops off another guy's arm with a machete. It's... Yeah, I, I had to look away a little. It's like Garden Wars. Yeah. Most of the gore and blood in this movie didn't bother me. When the assassin fell on the table leg, I looked away for that one. And then I looked away for like this entire scene... Because right before it started, the camera was showing us all these tools in the shed. They showed us the pitchfork and the saw blades. I'm like, oh, no, 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 no. This is going to be bad. <laughs> so I didn't watch the entire scene. <laughs> it was good. The nice thing about Commando is it's not gratuitous with its violence. It's not overly done. Like, you covered your eyes on a neck slitting scene that was extremely, like, not gory at all. Yeah. It was like Road Warrior, Warrior Woman slitting that guy's throat. Right. You couldn't violence. really see anything. Exactly. All so right. I think you're just so I overly squeamish one. at times. <laughs> Even the arm getting chopped off was very tame. Well, I saw the head get sliced off. Mm -hmm. And that was like, nope, nope, I'm done. As John is going through this villa, he eventually gets into the house. And he goes toe-to-toe -to -toe with Arius, who has one of those fancy French rifles like Carl has in Die Hard. And him and John, their showdown is pretty much Arius peeks out, fires a couple of shots, go back into cover. John peeks out of cover, fires a shot, goes back into cover. And it's just back and forth. Yeah, such a waste of ammo. Yeah. Eventually, John catches Arius up on a balcony and blasts him with the shotgun a few times. And Arius goes backwards through a window. He's gone. Yeah. He's not really the main bad guy in this. Bennett no. really feels, fills that role. Yes. Arius he... is an impetus, but he's not an antagonist. Yes. And by this time, Jenny has escaped from her prison room. Mm -hmm. Bennett knows this and is chasing after her. Yeah. Right about the time that John begins assaulting the compound, he gets a call from Valverde. The plane has landed. They've discovered the corpse. And they know something is up. And so yes. Bennett is hunting for Jenny, who's escaped the yes. captive room. And when he gets her, he is going to kill her. Mm -hmm. That is the order that he has from Arius. So John, after he takes out Arius, is now hunting for Jenny, which he was looking for her the whole time. The fact right. that he ran into Arius is just icing on the cake. But he eventually finds Jenny in the basement of the building, and Bennett is there with her. And he's basically holding her hostage, and he's going to shoot her or kill her or something like that. And John's like, listen, Bennett, this is between you and me. The girl has nothing to do with it. Let her go. And I love the way that John goads Bennett into fighting him. Oh, yeah. 
says like, you've wanted a piece of me for so long. And this, you know, you don't need to hide behind a girl. You don't need to hide behind a gun. And he pulls out his big Bowie knife and he's like, you just want to, you should fight me one-on-one so you could look into my eyes when you plunge a knife into my heart and all this other stuff. Yeah. He kind of breaks him psychologically. Yeah. Bennett kind of loses it a little bit. He gets that bloodlust rising. Yes. And so he pushes Jenny aside and pulls out his knife and they have this awesome hand-to-hand fight this fight was the one that for me and my tastes went on a little long Mm -hmm. for me it was definitely one of those fights that come back for see how it ends and i'm good because it starts off with them knife fighting they fall down onto a lower level they start wailing on each other with pipes and the door to a furnace and all this other stuff each of them try and push the other into a furnace and eventually bennett is pushed up against a boiler or something like that and he's got his hands on a gun and he's like oh i'm gonna shoot you i'm i'm the bad guy and john rips a pipe off the wall throws it at bennett and just impales him through the chest into the boiler behind and so bennett is impaled to the boiler, dead, hanging on a pipe, and there is steam shooting out the end of a pipe. Yeah, and I had a problem with that steam. John Matrix says, let off some steam, Bennett. Yeah, shouldn't that <laughs> pipe have been plugged with Bennett's body parts? Honestly, there's nothing that makes sense about this death. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And, I mean, he would have had to throw that pipe really, really hard. Like with the strength of a Terminator? Yes, yes, thank you. To get it to go through... Bennett's entire body and then through the tank. Mm -hmm. That just doesn't make any sense. That's an awesome end and we get one last Arnold quip. And it's at this point outside the army starts showing up because Cindy was able to contract General Kirby and he shows up with a bunch of helicopters and John is walking out with Jenny on his arm. He like carries that girl everywhere he can because she's tiny. Yeah. (laughs) But the general's like... John, I want you to start your commando unit back up. I want you to come back to the army. And John's like, nope. And Cindy's there with the airplane that they stole. And she pops out of the airplane and they all get in and fly away. Yep. And that's the end of the movie. That's the end of the movie. Do you think Cindy and John have a fling Arm after item? this? No. They had good chemistry, but not romantic chemistry. Yeah. Just good partnership chemistry. I think it's going to be like, okay, at the end of Finding Nemo, when Marlon and Dory are just like friends, like she's like Dory's just a family friend, Mm -hmm. a very close family friend, but there's no, there was nothing there. I think it's going to be like that. I appreciate that you noticed that because I think the standard Hollywood formula is that they have this thing and then they fly away together and you just assume that they're going to get together, but it's not really necessary. No. I mean, I think the reason that Cindy was so willing to help John is because eventually, as they're driving in Sully's car on the way to the hotel, he explains the situation to her. Yeah, shows her a picture of his daughter. Bad men have taken my kid. I need to save her. Yeah. They're going to kill her. At that point, Cindy is like 100% on board. Yeah. So I don't know what their situation is afterwards. I don't think there's a commando sequel, which it really doesn't need to. No. Because the general is like, ah, you'll be back. And what does he end the movie by saying? Like, not a chance or something like that? Yeah, something lame. Yeah. There are so many, so many good one-liners in this movie. Mm -hmm. And the one that the movie went out on was lackluster. Kind of lackluster, yeah. Yeah, I was a little disappointed because, man, this movie. (laughs) I'm looking at the IMDb user ratings. It's got an average rating of 6.7. Okay. Mm Mm-hmm. It seems a little bit low to me. Yeah, about 27% of people that rated the movie, a little over 33,000 people gave it a 7. Over 13,000 people gave it a 10. And very few people, by comparison, gave it a 1 and 2 and 3 star rating. I'm not sure I would give it a 10, Mm -hmm. but I think I would be very comfortable giving it like an 8. Yeah, I mean, compared to Metal Storm, which was only a 3.7. Well, compare it to Metal Storm, then I'll give it a 10. Yeah, I had a lot of fun watching this movie, and it was really nice to see a quality product. If there was one particular thing that you could select as your favorite thing, what do you think it would be? I think Cindy was my favorite part. She was 
a normal person. She stood up against the sexual harasser way back in the beginning when we first met her. And she was distrustful of John because he kidnapped her. Mm -hmm. And then, like, she, for some reason, I'm still not really, like, 100% on how she ended up back in the car with him. Like, why? But she found a reason to stick with him and then just learn the history of why he's doing this and everything and then went all in with him. And she was just a really great helper. She was capable. I love that she read the instruction manual on the rocket launcher and was able to save John. And she had good skills learning to fly a plane, Mm -hmm. which made sense for the character that we knew. She was a stewardess. So, you know, it made sense that she would also be learning how to fly a plane. So she was just a really normal person that was very helpful. Mm -hmm. And her lines were really good. Yeah. How about you? The thing I appreciate most about this movie is the story. The narrative through line that justifies the end. Because it's really easy to make an action movie where, you know, he's the only man who can do the job. And so he's sent by the army into like a South Asian country to just shoot people and do stuff, which I know I'm just describing a Rambo movie, but I appreciate that this movie in particular gives extremely good excuses as to why he's doing all of this stuff. Yes. And I I love the through line and how everything, and I know I've said these things before, but the story makes sense to me. It makes logical progressions from one thing to the next, and I care about the characters and what's happening to them. I, to go back to the last movie we saw, I really didn't care about what happened to Dojin, and Rhodes was such a minor character, and Diana was barely there. Here, I cared about Cindy, I cared about John, I wanted Jenny to escape. Like, these people, I was able to connect with them, and so I think the story itself was my favorite part of this movie. It was, the story was really, really excellent. Excellent. Yeah. So was there anything about this movie that you didn't like? I did not like the fight choreography in the final showdown between Bennett and John. That was going to be mine. I found it to just be a little clumsy. It was very claustrophobic. There were a lot of weird cuts. I feel like after the montage of John walking through a storm of bullet fire to just get into this cramped little space and get into this situation, I feel like it didn't show off the skills that we were told that Bennett had. I wish that they had gone into a different environment, that they had an opportunity to show off that John and Bennett had very similar skills, that they had very similar physical ability. I mean, really, they tumbled around a lot. They grappled. They got really up close and personal. It was not so much a action scene as much as like a psychological match between the two of them. And when you've got these two actors, big muscled actors that are going to fight hand to hand. I just expected more. And I just felt like it was a little lackluster. I will admit the end let off some steam. Bennett was pretty funny, but it's the choreography that led up to it that I just didn't exactly like. I thought it was just lacking in some way. I wholeheartedly agree with you. That was going to be my thing. Sully and his whole sexual harassment thing Mm -hmm. was very uncomfortable. Yeah. Yeah. And it did tell us things about his character, but I don't think that they were things we needed to know. Yeah. Like, oh, this guy who is a bad guy that we know is a bad guy because he's working for bad guys. Oh, he's also a creep to women? Well, kind of big deal. Yeah. I'm not sure that it really progressed his character or made him more of a bad guy for us. Yeah. He's a bad guy. He works to the bad guy. I think it's very fair that Sully was your least favorite part of this movie because I think that's exactly how he was written. He was written to be people's least favorite part of the movie. Yeah. I mean, when Arnold drops him off of the cliff and just lets gravity decide... Like, he wholeheartedly deserved that. Yeah, he really did. Maybe that's why we saw the scenes with him and Cindy, so that we would be extra happy when he was dropped off the cliff. Yeah. Maybe they were trying to cover John for the fact that that was... A lot of what John does in this movie is more or less murder. (laughs) Right. Like, it was really harsh dropping him off the cliff like that. So maybe to make us a little happier about it, they upped Sully's creep factor. Yeah. 
But no, wasn't cool. It tells me that the writers of this movie did their job. Yeah, I guess so. To make you hate that guy. Yeah, because so I like extra okay hated him. <laughs> Do you have any final thoughts or a recommendation as we've gotten to the end of talking about this movie? My final thought is just that this movie absolutely fulfilled my expectations. I wanted to have a good time. I had a good time. I like the runtime. It was about 90 minutes, right? It is, according to the IMDb page, one hour and 30 minutes. It's 90 minute runtime. I think is perfect. I find action movies kind of exhausting. They take a lot of my energy and a lot of my paying attention. So the 90 minute runtime for me was very, very perfect. And it kept the storyline tight and quick. And I had a blast. Mm. And I would absolutely recommend that people watch this movie. I am so glad that we watched this movie. I had a really good time. And like I said, this movie exceeded my expectations. I thought it was just going to be Arnold Schwarzenegger going through just shooting dudes for 90 minutes. And it turned out to be so much more than that. It was a mystery story, like a thriller type of thing. Not exactly classical noir style in any respect, but there was a fun little investigatory line that we followed. And I two would wholeheartedly recommend this movie. This is, uh, I believe, the second movie out of the four hiatus films we've watched so far that we enthusiastically recommended. The first being Gallipoli, which was more solemnly recommended. Right. This is an enthusiastic recommend. Yeah, Gallipoli is a movie I think people should watch, Mm -hmm. like for your own edification and to learn about the world. This is a movie I think people should watch because it's fun. Yeah. This is the kind of movie that you can put on at a party. Like, if you want some background noise and you're at a fun environment, you can put on Commando in the background and just let it play. Yes, you can. (laughs) It's really fun. So, it's so much better than Metal Storm. (laughs) (laughs) Oh, just so obvious. We are going to watch a movie next time that... I'm hoping, splits the difference between Metal Storm and Commando. It is a more or less superhero movie that is connected to the Mad Max franchise because there are a couple of people in the cast that are from Road Warrior. It's set, I believe, set in Australia. But there'll be more information about that movie on the listener page. So I hope you keep an eye out on the listener page for more information about that. And just join us for the next time. The Mad Max Minute podcast is a fan project by Rick and Julia Ingham. The Mad Max franchise was created by George Miller and Byron Kennedy and presented by Warner Brothers Pictures in association with Village Roadshow Pictures. Commando is presented by SLM Production Group in association with Silver Pictures and 20th Century Fox. Mad Max Minute is produced and edited by Rick Ingham. Our opening music is by Daniel Batista of DanielBatista.com. You can follow Mad Max Minute on Twitter at Mad Max Minute, on Facebook at Mad Max Minute Beyond Microphone, and at MadMaxMinute.com. And finally, if you would like to contribute to the podcast, visit MadMaxMinute.com, click on the support link at the top of the page, and check out our Patreon to help us keep the tanks full. Thank you for joining us for our review of Commando. We'll see you next time. 